Hello, Tomaso Coliva here. I've been making records for the last 20 years, and even though this makes me feel a little bit old, I've seen a lot of changes on how records are made. Today, we're going to see a few of these changes and how Antelope Gear helped me with some serious challenges. After my teenage years spending, spent making beats on uh, an MPC in my bedroom, I cut my teeth uh, as an assistant and engineer at Officina Meccanica, that is uh, the biggest studio in Northern Italy, if not the whole of Italy. Back in the days, they had four rooms there, one with a 72 channels Neve, another one with a 24 channel Neve, one with a SSL 4000, uh, one with a Quodate desk, and an insane collection of artwork gear, 1176s, LA2As, Sontek EQs, uh, Neve Pre's, APIs, you mentioned they had it. Plus uh, an array of microphones that range from uh, AKG C24s to U47s uh, to all sorts of uh, vintage German mics. Plus uh, backline, amps uh, and everything you could dream about. We were having different sessions every day, ranging from rock bands to orchestral stuff, to soundtracks, to classical music, to solo piano, and that taught me so much. I remained there five years, probably sleeping on the couch uh, half days, and uh, working the night shift because nobody wanted to do. But I just, it was so valuable that I would redo it instantly. All these happened when uh, the first Pro Tools HD rigs were coming out. Basically, hard disk recording took over the recording section sector altogether. We still had a session using Studers and Ampex, but that faded quite quickly because we could uh, record faster and faster and make an insane amount of tracks. We started with the uh, 24 in and outs and we ended up uh, with 64 in and outs uh, in a matter of like 18 months on top of that of course because of that converters uh, were challenged to be better and better and better and they started to sound okay still not comparable to the analog world that was still the best sounding machine as i mentioned studer and ampex uh, but they weren't too far apart we had uh, we changed a few different units uh, at with quite rapid changeovers. We started with the uh, Digi Designs uh, stock ones, uh, but then uh, upgraded to Apogee and Prisms, uh, and each one was taking the quality of the conversion one step up and uh, making us r less uh, regretful of the of losing the analog sound. Officina was uh, kind of forced to do this because it was the international spot, the spot for the international artists that were passing through Milan. We had uh, this usual thing about an artist having a day off in Milan between concerts, uh, calling his A&R at the label like, oh, I need to record, where should I go? And they were sending artists uh, to Officina quite steadily. That's how I work with uh, Eric Badu. Mano Chao, Michael Nyman, Shania Twains, and Franz Ferdinand, and Phoenix, to mention a few. And uh, it was great to see engineers from all over the world come in and having their request and see where, uh, what they were looking for. Then one day, English band Muse came to do a short session, what well, was supposed to be a short session, but they came in and brought loads of their own gear. They brought their backline uh, and, uh, and their Pro Tools rig that included interface and master clock. It was supposed to be a four day quick in and out session to record strings at the end of Black Holes and Revelation album, but they ended up staying two months uh, to finish the whole thing and they went straight from Officina to Townhouse in London to mix it. They expanded gradually. They took uh, one room first, uh, studio, studio A, but then uh, they changed uh, and they did uh, a full studio takeover 
With three rooms running at the same time, they needed a second engineer to manage some overdubs, uh, and boom, I started out helping Rich Costi and recorded loads of overdub myself. At the end of this period, Ma Matthew asked me to build uh, his new home studio on Como Lake. He just bought a house there. It was the start of the big journey for me, and uh, it has been uh, interesting so far, to say the least. The studio started as a small production room, just to do demo and stuff. But within three years of building it, we ended up uh, with a fully blown studio, with two control rooms, uh, uh, a big SSL desk in one of them, uh, three live rooms, uh, and three bomb-proofed ISO booths. Since the studio was owned by the band, we didn't have any clock ticking during pre-production, and we spent weeks, if not months, uh, testing everything we had, A-B testing stuff. We tested microphones, we tested mic reads, we tested amps, guitar, drums, uh, everything needed to be the best to record that album. And since they had uh, such a huge collection of gear, we needed uh, to select uh, only the top. We discovered a few interesting things on each, each category. We beta tested and uh, like mics that were supposed to be great that didn't sound as good as others that sounded, that were less revered. And the same thing with amps, same thing with cabs. So we kind of built our color palette during that period leading us to the proper recording period. Uh, and that's the period when uh, and where I encountered uh, Antelope Audio for the first time. And I met them because they launched uh, the Atomic Clock on the market. There was, I think it was their first product, uh, and uh, it was supposed to be the best sounding master clock ever built. And uh, I think they got quite a good pedigree to say that because Advark uh, master clocks uh, uh, were already the best ones uh, of the previous generation. We already had uh, a top spec Pro Tools rig, but as with the rest of the studio, we wanted uh, only the absolute best available 2008, 2009. Uh, and so we just, uh, we just called them. We just called them uh, and asked uh, to, to send down uh, a clock because uh, uh, we wanted to try. We ordered one. And uh, what I did, I remember setting uh, the 10M and the OCX, one next to the other, next uh, to the other two best clocks available at the time. Uh, and we performed uh, a quite a deep uh, A-B test on that as well. We were basically running uh, a 48 channel full mix on an SSL desk from Pro Tools via the interfaces that we were using. Um, and then the whole mix back into tools uh, via a really good stereo converter, clocking the thing every time with a different master clock. We basically were doing the whole round, re recording into tools. Uh, Use and only changing the master clock. After we performed these uh, three passes of uh, same mix with same converter, same everything, but different master clock, we shuffled. I shuffled files, and I uh, uh, I called a five uh, friend engineer to do some testing with me, including Giovanni Versari, that is the guy that later on mastered. Uh, Grammy winning drones for us. And we were quite, quite shocked by the results. Because uh, uh, as with all blind tests, we just set up uh, the Protoss rig to output the three different files uh, on the console through three different external inputs. And uh, we were just switching between the three. And uh, with one of the master clocks, and I, I, I swear they were the best clocks available at the time, hands down. One of them sounded uh, almost broken compared to the other ones. The highs were kind of distorted. Uh, there was no depth whatsoever. 
on the on the stereo field uh, and were just like wrong. Uh, the other one, uh, the contender, so to say, to the antelope, uh, that was our best uh, previous best choice, sounded fine, but it was uh, a little bit too aggressive and mid forward, and uh, and most of it, it was uh, it was so different than uh, the mix uh, coming out from the desk without without the other conversion while with the atomic clock everything was uh, super wide both in the stereo field and uh, in depth and frequency wise with an incredible detail on each transient even when uh, you had distorted transient you could hear the distortion transient really fast and really crispy but not hyped not exaggerated in any way it was true to the sound that we had from the desk so we it, it was a no-brainer it was a no-brainer there was like an overall agreement uh, between uh, all the five persons involved in this test were like this is the best one this is clearly the best one so we kept uh, the clock we kept the clock uh, and we did uh, the whole album with it and i think we stayed uh, using that clock for like ages i think we did uh, we did the whole resistance that was the fir the first album we used the clock on we did uh, second low and we did drones as well clocking every clock every converter we used on those albums uh, was clocked uh, with the 10m through the OCX. And this is how I entered Antelope Audio World, a world uh, of, uh, I discovered, of unparalleled quality in sound uh, and detail, but also stability and reliability, because uh, these units never let me down in like t more than 10 years. Another, another time, uh, keep on talking about Muse, another time uh, that not only the Atomic Clock, but its uh, distribution unit, the OCX, helped me incredibly, is uh, when uh, Muse performed live at the Olympic Stadium in Rome. It was a huge concert. I think it's uh, the venue is like uh, 80,000 seats capacity or something like that. And a week before the concert, I got a call from the manager asking me uh, which room I wanted. And I was like, uh, nobody asked me to come down to Rome. And, he's, and he was like, no, of course you need to come. We need to record uh, a DVD of the, of the concert. So in a week, we had to put together the whole recording for, for that concert. And uh, it was a great challenge. It was a great challenge because uh, uh, the main challenge was uh, the fact that Muse were already touring with uh, a recording rig that was recording uh, every gig at 2496 from the front of the house. For the gig in Rome, we obviously decided to expand uh, the number of room mics uh, like uh, spread across the whole stadium. But we only had 96 channels available at front of the house to record. So the solution there was to record uh, the ambience mics with an OB track that was uh, sitting outside the stadium and use uh, that OB track to record um, uh, to, as a backup of the front of the house recording too. The thing was that the OB track, uh, the whole OB system, was uh, structured uh, around uh, 48 kilohertz because uh, that is the standard for broadcast. So they were using uh, digital stage boxes, and uh, and that we couldn't change that. So we, th we we thought, okay, that's fine for as a backup for our recording, but to allow stability and. Uh, interchangeability between files and to be able to sync like everything needed to be sync to be perfectly sync 
So solution and and obviously the recording rig at the front of the house was synced with the whole digital system used for the concert with the digital desk. So we definitely couldn't jeopardize uh, any of that. So the solution was to have uh, the 10M feeding the OCX. From the OCX, we had uh, two different clocks, one at 96 and the other one at uh, 48, going uh, one, the 96 one going to our main recording rig and uh, the 48 kilohertz one going uh, to the OB track via the digital stage boxes. Uh, that was a very stressful night for me, one of the most stressful night ever, because if the clock went down or if anything happened, uh, uh, the risk was to lose uh, such an important concert. That's why we had also a third 96 kil kilohertz recording rig, just to be sure. Uh, but I swear that a lot of my gray hairs belong to that night. So basically, Muse did an amazing three hours long concert. I can't, it was endless. They did this concert. I took files from the main Protoss rig. I took files uh, from the OB track. I went to a small room, uh, uh, a temporary control room, so to say, that I set up uh, in the dressing rooms. Uh, I imported all files within the same Proto session, up sampling 48 to 96, and uh, I synced uh, the very first kick drum, like sample perfect, uh, and I went all the way to the end of the concert, two hours and a half later, to the very last kick drum, and uh, they were sample perfect as well. So the clock stability throughout on both rigs uh, was just uh, amazing, was just incredible. And I, I, I didn't believe it was possible at the end, uh, at the end of that week. Uh, so it just, uh, after that gig, as I already said, the Antelope uh, 10M and OCX combination traveled with me uh, kind of around the globe for like a long time. <laughs> we recorded uh, in New York, we recorded uh, in LA at East West, we recorded at Capitol, we recorded at Shangri-La, Rick Rubin's place, uh, we recorded uh, at Woodshed in Malibu. Uh, we recorded uh, in Germany, we recorded in London at Air Studio, quite a, quite loads of time. And uh, it was uh, always with us uh, and uh, always delivering its stellar performance. And uh, even though we changed converters, uh, because that side evolved a lot, we, we were always happy about the master clock we had. So when a uh, few years later, I was, I moved to London, I moved to London and uh, I needed uh, an interface uh, because I was struggling with inputs and outputs on uh, my Protoss rig. They were not enough, never enough. I really always needed more and more inputs. And uh, Antelope released uh, an Ori the Orion 32 HD interface. That was a big game changer for me because uh, it, in just one unit, I could have 32 channels in and out, analog, connected with simply one cable on my HD cards with no clocking between interface shenanigans. So if I needed to travel, I could do that with no master clock and just uh, having a very solid, uh, solid system, uh, just uh, connecting one cable, bingo. I ordered one and uh, with a 32 HD, I started recording 32 analog channel from uh, my studio desk, uh, handling uh, all the monitoring need. I, I can monitor from Pro Tools, I could monitor through a summing box, but at the same time, I can have uh, 60, 16 channels going uh, to any headphone system, Avium uh, or Hearback or Midas or whatever. And uh, I could still have 16 channels at my disposal for like anything, for monitoring, for reamping, uh, uh, or to do hardware inserts or a summit box. 
uh, and actually that is uh, what the Orion 32 HD came very useful even at mixing stage after recording because at that point I could uh, use uh, the, Orion, uh, the Orion 32 to do hardware inserts and to have hardware inserts permanently wired on my patch bay. So I had like the first 16 channels going to my summing box and the second 16 channels going to artboard that I was using all the time while mixing. Let me show you how now it's wired and uh, it's used over here. So that's how I use the Orion 32 HD these days, but let me show you how it's wired in the studio. We basically have uh, 32 channels from the live room coming here, going to my studio desk and my other preamps uh, from the same patch bay, the output of the preamps and the desk uh, going through the, two, to the 32 HD. At the same time on the row below, we got 16 channels going to the summing mixer and, 32 ch and 16 channels going um, to this uh, power play headphone system that is down here. And this allows every musician to tweak his own mix while recording, especially when uh, we got different musicians recording together. That often happens uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this studio. So when recording is finished, uh, the good thing is that I can use all my artwork gear for mixing along with my plugins simply patching to, uh, to the interface. One thing that I love to do in this with the Orion is that I can, um, I can calibrate each input and output via the software. So if I have any, any artboard, any piece of gear that needs more input or less input, I can just uh, counterbalance the, the AD and the DA. But anyway, check this mix that I was working uh, um, last uh, last week. It's by a, a Turkish band called Ringo Jets. They do garage rock and they're just drums, bass, guitar. And, uh, and I was using quite a bit of Atwood gear. So check this mix I was working on last week. It's a, a Turkish garage rock band called Ringo Jets and uh, they really kick ass and uh, it's rock, it's drums, bass and guitar. So on this mix, uh, uh, apart from uh, all the plugins that you see on my plugin slots, I'm also using few hardware inserts. The first one been uh, kick and snare. Kick and snare are going through this uh, Neve 33115 mic pre and EQs uh, and then uh, through this uh, Neve 33609 compressor. The bass uh, is going through this distressor, uh, smashing it quite a bit but also uh, giving it more saturation to the signal. And then the whole mix bus is going through this GML 8200 EQ and then to this uh, TK Audio VCA SSL style compressor. Uh, let's have a listen to what these two are doing to the whole mix. <laughs> this is with the EQ and the compressor and this without. There's a little bit too much of the leverage. So this with the EQ and compressor, and this without, make a huge difference to me. Uh, the same thing uh, uh, it is true for kick and snare. Let's solo the drums. This is uh, with uh, kick and snare buses going through. The Neve and uh, the Neve EQ, and then the Neve compressor. This with the decompression. This without. Listen how the drum just lose punch. It's just more aggressive with the compression in as it is now. 
compression out. It just sounds weak. Let's do the same with the bass. This with the distressor. With the distressor. No distressor, it just becomes a little bit boring, I guess. And well, it's much angrier with the distressor on. Let's listen to drums and uh, drums and bass with hardware insert. And no hardware insert. Just became they become flat. One thing that I didn't consider at the beginning when I bought the Orion uh, 32 HD is that they're having two different, different ways to connect to my computer. I can use the Orion 32 HD to actually bridge uh, different software. And that was uh, quite an enlightenment discovery I had because uh, this allows me, mo uh, most of all, to use logic instruments on Pro Tools session. I frequently receive, uh, I'm Pro Tools based, but I frequently receive a uh, uh, demo done in Logic using Logic Instruments. So these allow me to cross the two software. Let me show you how on the HD software, basically I've got uh, Pro Tools connected uh, on, of course, via the HDX card in Logic uh, set to use uh, on Logic Preferences. You can see here, Logic Preferences Audio is using the Orion HD3 USB. So basically then I take out one and two from uh, the USB play and I put them onto the HDX inputs down here, 3132 you can see here okay so basically logic is feeding Pro Tools via that loop and at the same time I use uh, an internal MIDI bus called the two logic to send sig MIDI signals from Pro Tools to logic and this allows me to do this basically I got this instrument track on Pro Tools outputs uh, is set on to the to Logic Bus, channel one. Input for the track is B1516, that is 3132 on the HDX bus. So, it feels like it's an instrument in Pro Tools, but what's actually happening here now is that these MIDI notes are going to this Logic project This logic project that is a very simple project doesn't have anything it only has one track that is on record to be able to monitor through and what I'm doing is I'm using a plugin that the artist was using during pre-production within my production session so if I want to for example tweak this sound I can go and tweak distortion on this sound or take distortion out altogether. And it's perfectly in sync. This is just, it's such a simple thing, but it's mind blowing how it allows me compatibility with what happened before a song reached me at four full production stage because so, now I can actually keep all the sounds that are done within Logic or any other software during pre-production but still be able to tweak and mangle them and to tailor them to our final production.
the other addition to the latest addition from Antelope World has been this uh, fully blown monitor controller called the Satori. I don't know how to pronounce that in English, but it has uh, an insane amount of inputs and outputs. It has uh, eight stereo feed on the input and uh, four pairs of monitor plus four pair of headphones. Everything with uh, in-depth control of levels and calibration. You can see the interface of the software, for example, is just uh, mind-blowing. You got all the inputs uh, that you can switch via either software or pressing buttons on the remote control. And each one of them can be trimmed plus six or minus six. And uh, the same thing applies uh, to the outputs uh, that you can change via software here or via the buttons here. And as you can see on the, on the software side, I calibrated my third pair to be plus 6 dB to be matched with the, with the rest of the monitors I have. So when I switch, uh, there is no discrepancy in volume that I get distracted by. On uh, the right hand section, you have the headphone control. You can assign um, talkback individually to the full uh, headphone feed. So if I got a feed for myself uh, and I press the button, I don't hear myself talking down the talkback mic. Uh, and uh, I got quite, this is really useful for me because I'm really keen on having uh, my reference while I'm mixing. Let's see how they are. So basically staying on the mix that I'm working on, uh, I can show you that I have, well, down here, I got my different, um, my different speakers. So I got my ATC 25s, my Unity Audio Boulder, my Tivoli Audio Mono Reference, and my Bluetooth uh, transmitter that goes to the other room that I can listen uh, to anytime I want. And uh, on this top row, you can see that I got on input five, six, seven, and eight, uh, I got everything I need while mixing. So on input five, I got the whole mix that I'm working on. And uh, on input uh, eight, I got every mix uh, I print and send to the band or to the client. In this case, I don't have anything on uh, on old because uh, I don't have any previous mixes in the first mix for this song. Uh, on input six, uh, I've got the reference. Uh, in this case, the reference is the demo that the band sent. So it's not the actual recording I'm mixing. It's, uh, it's a demo they did that they love the dynamics that I can compare to at any point just to check that every piece of the puzzle is uh, in the correct spot. On, uh, in, on input three, on uh, channel seven, I got uh, Spotify running all day long with a different kind of music I may want to refer to. At the moment, I got a previous release of the band. So I can quickly check that what I'm doing is actually coherent with the identity of the band and likely better than anything they released before. But I can actually have Spotify just playing all sorts of music and just to see how this song fit in that context or any kind of music when I'm having a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, just to refresh my ears. So you saw how Antelope is integrated within my own small world where I live basically 24 seven. But gotta say Antelope gear has been very reliable, very useful giving me pristine sound when I wanted and an extreme amount of flexibility as well. And also inspiring, as we saw with the Pro Tools Logic thing, uh, I, I didn't think doing that in that way before, but just the fact that, that HDX and USB connections were working so well and so flawlessly separated actually give me the idea. So you should, uh, you should check it out as well. You should check Antelope Gear and make uh, their gear, your tools.